Welcome to Uncertain Things. This is Adam, and Vanessa is not here. She is in D.C. doing family things. So you've, you've, got, you've got me. But it's fine. Surely I can manage housekeeping on my own. But let's see. Well, we, we barely manage when we're together, so I'll just have to make it alone here in our Queen's apartment. Beloved Queen's. Queen's is a beautiful place. But if you do miss me and Vanessa disagreeing about things, then I did add a little bonus content at the end of the episode after the credits. It's a little slice from the editorial meeting that Vanessa and I had before the interview, the main interview, where we discussed the merits and demerits of current late night television and specifically the John Oliver show. So if you're interested, it's there in the post credit scene where I often hide content. Okay, speaking of content, today we have Rob Long. He's a writer, producer, worked on variety of TV shows, including the show Cheers, wrote books about the nightmare that is Hollywood, and produces the podcast Martini Shot, which I absolutely love, where he shares five-minute bites of musings about the experience of being a screenwriter. He also co-hosts the immensely entertaining Glup Culture podcast and co-founded Ricochet Media. I invited Rob because I've been itching to talk about the problem with Hollywood at the moment as a, somebody who is experiencing a lot of personal frustration with an industry that I love. But as you'll hear very quickly, Rob's stream of consciousness allows him to leap from surveying the world from the view of a Hollywood screenwriter onto the tragedy of the human condition very quickly. And from there, we easily got to everything from cancel culture to Disney to political tribalism to the loneliness of modern existence. And that's, that's what makes Martini Shot so enjoyable, and that's why I really enjoyed having this conversation. So I'm not going to belabor this. We'll jump right in. One thing that I do want to say before is that uh, we've decided after a lot of prompting from friends and, and listeners to, to start a Patreon. And it's not, we're not going to put anything behind the paywall. We want the podcast to be available to anybody who cares about these conversations. But we figured, again, after a lot of prompting, that if people want to help us and support us and make it easier for us to produce more episodes more frequently... Then, then why not? So we're doing it. So we're going to have a Patreon. It's going to be Uncertain Things on Patreon. Uh, if, you, if you feel like giving us your monthly uh, coffee, th then we'll be extremely grateful. It will allow us to do a lot more work. For instance, right now I'm working on editing an episode that I recorded in Jerusalem, which had a little more investigative journalism quality to it, looking into some refugees from Gaza. And these things just take a little more time, a little more work, a little more research, and, and sometimes I require just like technical things like being able to get a transcript. So that's where your support will go, just to make sure that we have more bandwidth to deal with these things. And we thought to add some nice little perks for people who do um, wish to support us, like maybe joining me and Vanessa during our editorial meetings and help us um, think about questions, be involved in building the editorial calendar and thinking about who should be our next interview and, and what topics we should explore. And also join us for AMA sessions and possibly live Zoom events with some of our guests where you'll be able to ask them questions directly. If there is some responsiveness, we'll be very happy to experiment with whatever you'll be interested in. So if you're, you feel like supporting our work, uh, we, we, we will be very grateful. Otherwise, what we always deeply appreciate is sharing the podcast with your friends. Tell more people to listen. We just want to get to as many loving and hating ears as possible. And Oh, and for that end, obviously, uh, subscribe wherever you find us. And if you're feeling generous, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts because it really helps a shit ton. And with that expletive, Rob Long. Hey there. Hey. Heidi Ho, thanks for joining us. Uh, happy to be here. Can you Hope hear me okay? I'm feeling better. You know, I mean, I just I was at the doctor this morning and they like, yeah. they, I, I was said, this has been two weeks now. I still feel a little bit dizzy. And they're like, yeah, that's how it works. 
So it's like teaching the patients, I guess. Yeah. Like desperately. As if the late. pandemic didn't teach you that already. <laughs> I know. Apparently, I was a slow learner. Yeah. But but, but it's better. Thanks. So it's it's better. It's like it's like one of those things where you just you just feel a little bit like you're pretending not to be drunk. Mm. Um. Even though, like, my brain's working. It's just right. A bit, a little bit, but it's actually fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. taking it as an invitation to just to do everything much slower than you would normally do. Right. And. <laughs> Does it also mean that, does it preclude you from actually drinking? No. In fact, th- this is the weird thing. I said to the doctor, the neuro- neurologist today, I said, you know, after a couple glasses of wine, it kind of goes away. <laughs> yeah. And her response is, yeah, that actually makes sense. Oh, no. That's not what, that's not the medical advice that one needs. And yet, if it's true, I'm <laughs> taking it to the bank. <laughs> like, what, I, I just, I'm, can, I can only imagine that there were parts of that sentences that your memory has omitted. <laughs> that could be, but I feel like you're um, being judgy. <laughs> <laughs> I am certainly not. I'm drinking my my four o'clock wine. Oh, there you go. Adam's the resident wine drinker of the podcast for sure. But, uh, where now? Where are you both? So usually we're roommates in New York City, and we're okay. usually recording in the same apartment. But I am in D.C. Uh, oh. for the month visiting okay. family. Oh, well, that's good. But if I it guess. was the the flavor that you heard in my accent, that's because I'm Israeli. I figured you were Israeli, but uh, it was more just that you're a cartoon image, <laughs> and Vanessa is a real like person. So I was like more like, well, maybe you're kind of generated. Yeah, <laughs> auto generated from yeah, Israel could be worse. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, Rob. I'm happy to. Yeah, we've been wanting to to talk to uh, to people from the creative class for for a while. We got stuck oh, in the political realm, and I, as, as actually that was my. First question, actually, my zero question was, uh, in, you should introduce yourself to your audience in case they, they don't know you, even though we'll give you the proper intro ourselves later. But I would like to hear how you describe yourself. What's your elevator um, bio? But then question number one will be, and you can slip right into it later, is like, what, what, what do you feel about the word content? <laughs> content? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I actually feel like content, my feeling of content is that like, that's the, the the bare minimum word we came up with it's like it's like food there are a lot of things that qualify technically as food that mm-hmm. you don't want to put in your mouth and i feel like that's true for content a lot of things technically are content that you don't want to look at or read um so like but you know so people say i'm a content creator like i don't even know what that Aim higher is basically what I you know would say. Dream bigger dreams than being a content creator. And a question for you as as, as somebody who has been a content creator for uh, most of your life, and also somebody who presumably pays attention to the English language. Um, and and and, and right. uh, for me as an outsider, it seems to me that the word content has invaded and and parasitically latched onto the language relatively recently as a as a dominant descriptor of of somebody's broad creative endeavors do you do you also feel it or have you been encountering it throughout the ages well no i mean it's it's, it's new it's it, it was it's new because the there was this explosion of abilities to communicate with people and to show them pictures and moving pictures and audio before there was a reason or anything to do with those things and so you couldn't call what is what do you what is your crazy relatives facebook rant call what is your stupid tweet called? What is the picture of you pretending to enjoy a restaurant meal called? Like, we don't have words for those, but we had a capacity to do them. And then we had to come up with something. And so the people who designed these things who really didn't, were not, you know, making, they were not editing or writing or creating or whatever. They just said, that, well, that's where the content's going to go. So this is like, this is the vessel and inside the vessel, you put whatever you want. And, um, and that's kind of how that started. And then, then pretty much people thought, oh, well, if, if, if it doesn't have to be good, then I'll do it. And so, <laughs> you know, that's basically what Facebook is, right? It's a bunch of people who aren't really good at it doing it. And um, that's content. I also see content as that thing that keeps ads glued together. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and, the, and the, in, the, in the old days, they... They kind of felt like it, it wasn't. It was first of all hard to do, like to actually broadcast radio drama or make a movie was hard. So only a few people could really afford to do it or had the ability to do it. 
and they realized they were competing at a very high level with other people, not that many, right? I mean, then for most of the time, there's there were two radio networks, then three, then a bunch of little ones, but basically everybody's competing. There aren't a handful of people at the top of the pyramid competing for your attention. And they all had to be good. So they, it was like, they, no one would ever say, we, we do content. They would say, I do game shows. I do drama. I do comedy. I do beautiful photographs. Like the, the, the photo editor Life Magazine for 50 years or however long that lasted, that, I guess he did content, but not really. I mean, they just looked at pictures that people, photographers were making, and they show, uh, you know, that's, that's just what I mean, is that the quality part of it um, became less uh, meaningful. And it still is less meaningful. I mean, people, what is it? They spend an hour, an, almost an hour a, a day on TikTok, which is about an hour a day on YouTube. But interestingly, the the rise of TikTok has not meant the decline of YouTube. Just people are watching <laughs> more YouTube and TikTok. Um, and some of it's really awful. Some of it's good, but a lot of it's really terrible. But it's all content. Do you think the rifeness of satisfactory content is reducing the need to create good shit well i mean it's like uh, there's two ways to do it like well there's the either i would say t there are two sides of it right one side is this incredibly cool interesting freedom that people mm. uh on youtube and i think on tiktok too are 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 um are expressing themselves really directly i mean there's just a whole lot more direct honesty between and among people because the there are these fearless you know, usually younger people on TikTok and on, on YouTube just looking at the camera and saying, hey, here's what I'm afraid of. Here's what happened to me. Um, and that's really kind of great. And there's also like just another group of people who are younger, usually because they grew up like this, just coming up with really, 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 really funny things that are 45 seconds or less. And then on TikTok, they've sort of created this own kind of short form of version of, of TV. Uh, you know, this TikTok, you could, you could spend a day on TikTok only watching cooking TikTok. And it's better than cooking TV. It's better than, you know, Food Network. Uh, it, that's, the op, that's the optimistic side, right? So the, 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 the good side is that people are training themselves and really becoming really good at this kind of communication. Honest, direct, like weird, you know, people get recognized from being on TikTok. On Experimental. TikTok yeah. But it doesn't feel like Hollywood's picking up on the good aspects of of what's happening on social media it doesn't feel like like traditional media is becoming more honest or or, or direct or something like that or, or right it, it mostly just feels like it's it's dumbing it down somehow or i don't know i, I don't know see how that directional relationship being ben mutually beneficial somehow well the, the problem with tiktok and, and youtube and places like that if you're in show business or you're in the entertainment industry is you can't really make money at it Right. I mean, you, you, the, these are these are individuals making money, but there's no particular reason why that person needs to be on TV. Um, I mean, I'm not even sure that the cook, you know, traditionally, the, just as an example, cooking people, they'll be, they're on, you know, Rachel Ray's on Food Network, and then um, she like cooks a omelet and a spaghetti. And then before you know it, somebody's knocking on her door saying, hey, Rachel, we, we have this line of cookware. We want it to be the Rachel Ray cookware. And she goes, OK. And then she makes 100 million million dollars. That could happen next year or next week from somebody just based on TikTok, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so all those things are in their growth, you know, like the green shoots right now. But that could also happen. So show business now has this problem where um, what do we show? <laughs> right? What do we put on that's different from what you're already getting? And what we put on are like gigantic spectacles and movies, right. huge things where there's lots of special effects, which no one else can afford, um, or weird serials that are very dark, or movie stars, because stars are really important, get you to watch. Um, but I think they're missing. I mean, I think, I, think, I, I think that's just a surrender that was unnecessary, and I hope changes, because, you know, like, you look at what people in your life talk about. Or argue about it. Maybe even in your friends group or your family group, um, those uh, those conversations and debates and arguments and things those should be on TV. That's what they traditionally have been. Television It's like where you you know you watch it all in the family or the or some show, and they would be kind of arguing about the stuff that you're arguing about. And you just don't do that on TV anymore. You, they they won't they won't let you. Um, and so all of that conflict, I think, has. 
I don't know, defaulted to the worst possible place for it, which is social media on Twitter and Facebook and places like that, where people just basically scream at each other all day. And no one has to keep your attention, you know? Whereas, when, at least when you're writing a little scene where you kind of like have to do both sides and has to be mm. funny and has to be sort of human, you get to believe it's real. But on Twitter or Facebook, it doesn't have to be real. Just be, you, I'm just screaming at you. And your theory for the reason that it vanished from uh, traditional television or, or the screen arts is because, um, I'm sorry for using the word art. I didn't mean to I, trigger I, you. I, I, I forgive you. Um, <laughs> is because that they, they just, Hollywood figured out that that's not their competitive advantage, that they don't need to deal with it anymore? Um, I think maybe also that it's just trouble in general. You know, the thing is that everybody in Hollywood is basically the same. You know, people who do television and movies are kind of the same. They're kind of rich people who live in L.A. or New York, and they kind of have rich people concerns. And, I mean, you know, <laughs> I always laugh when they about, like, more diversity behind the screen. Well, you know, there's diversity and there's diversity. I mean, the stories you tell may be specific, but you're still a multimillionaire telling them. So you're not mm. that diverse, you know? I mean, and I think that people are generally afraid of, 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 of describing the truth or depicting the truth. Um, and that's sort of too bad because that's kind of... The point? That's the, yeah, that's, that's, that's what they should be doing. I mean, I don't know. I don't mind watching, you know, Wonder Woman or Saving the World or whatever or you know, Black Widow. That's fine. I don't care. But it used to be you turn on TV and you read the next day, you like, oh my God, did you see that? They, they, were, they were talking about this thing that we're all talking about. So it feels like there's this giant disconnect between the things that we talk about all day and argue about and the stories that were being that are being told in show business and you know i, I think that's a surrender i don't think it has to be um it's just you know look if everybody's doing okay and you're you know people are still going to the movie theaters and you know netflix still making money like uh, why why you know why fix it if it ain't broke but i think it is, it is broke and we're and people in show business are watching it just break in slow motion Fewer people watching TV. Fewer people going to the movies. They're just not scratching the itch people want scratched. So I, I, I keep I keep delaying the question of like, can you introduce yourself? But I I'll, I'll keep, I keep doing that. <laughs> no, I think just did. We're, this is a non <laughs> this, is, this is a nonlinear interview. Good, good. I'm a nonlinear person. <laughs> because what you're touching on now is I, I think the premise for me conceptually when 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 I reached out to you was I'm I'm incredibly depressed and uh um, um, bored and i think and, and and you know it might it might just be me just by me be who i am but i i like to blame other people for it and i blame the, the the media around me when i don't drink i just blame the media my my, my question is, is is i remember i i think i remember maybe i'm nostalgizing in my brain but i, I think i remember writing being good i remember shows being good i remember f going to tv and f act like you're describing seeing it you yeah. know, touching me and making me think and making me right. like uh, b want to become a better person um, or, or a worse person, but whatever, like wanting to right. change, to modify my behavior to something and, and not like make me feel dead inside. So I, I want you to tell me what, what is happening. Okay, so what, what's your response to this? Your well, nonlinear response? Yeah, no, I think part of it, my nonlinear response, but part of it is the, is the, is the essential problem, the unsolvable problem with entertainment. And that is a problem only for the people who produce it and for the shareholders of the companies that produce it. It's not a problem for anybody else. The problem is, I don't know what you want to watch. And that's a corollary of the big problem, which is that you don't know what you <laughs> want to watch. What you want is something surprising and interesting, and you don't want me to ask you. You just want to, mm -hmm. you know, you want to have a whole bunch of choices, and you want to pick something. Um, and over time, like we have convinced ourselves that I can, if I just get, you know, 27 statistically representative people in a room and ask them enough questions, I will find out what it is you want to watch. And I think that may work in part. I mean, every, you know, people love McDonald's French fries, right? That is, in fact, a true fact. They test them all the time and people love McDonald's French fries. But I don't think people like only McDonald's French fries. Even people who love McDonald's French fries don't want to only eat McDonald's French fries. That's a quick way to like not like McDonald's French fries. Um, whereas if every single movie you watch is complicated by either a complicated something or it's a, a superhero movie in which every moment is the same. They're identical moments. Um, you know, okay. 
loud and it's cool, but like eventually you just your brain turns off of it. And what um, what show business is best at is discovering new w- ways to delight you that surprise both you and me. So my my example for that is I remember like in, in olden times, um, in 1993 or four, uh, I was doing a, 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 a developing a show for for uh, NBC. And they said to us when we were developing it, there are too many young people in the show. This is a show about all, all young people living in New York City. And I said, we don't want, we already have a pilot like that and we don't like it because they're only young people <laughs> living in the city. And young people don't watch TV. And the people who control the television sets are uh, middle aged women, usually the moms. So you need to have one of those in your show. You need to, like, you can't just have young people. So we were like dutiful and thought, well, you know, look, the research is the research. So we changed our show and we put a middle-aged woman in it and a middle-aged guy in it. And it was more of an ensemble piece. And then, um, and we were off cycle. So we were going to be, we we're like a few months behind this other show, which they were developing and they did not like. That was young people living in the city. That was going to die, they told us. This is not going to last very long because young people do not watch TV. And then they put that show on and that show was called Friends. And they had no idea that that show was going to be a success. So there's some people in the company championing it, but it was just not going to be as they did not plan on it. I know they didn't because they told us they didn't. Um, now later, of course, like every company, they pretended like that was their strategy all along and we knew, we knew, we knew, but they didn't, but they, at least they, the, it doesn't really matter whether they knew or they didn't. They, they created an opportunity for themselves to have a blockbuster unexpected hit. And that is exactly what you need to do. And the only real way to succeed in the entertainment business, right? Um, and you see the opposite happening now. And I'm like, I, you know, look, Hollywood is a great place to go and become a rich person. It is not necessarily mm-hmm. a great place to go to become a rich shareholder because the companies are always looking for that flywheel, whatever it is, that contraption that kind of re- can rubber stamp or, or, or stamp out hits. And that is just not the way it works. It's much more of a venture business where you kind of don't know. And you, you just got to go in your instinct and, um, you know, if you've lived in LA long enough or you've been in the show business long enough, you don't longer have an instinct. You just, that, that part of you isn't like fully operative for some reason as you get older. Um, and that ultimately is the problem. And that I, I think is why, look, look, what, what, why do people like TikTok so much? What's TikTok's brilliant uh, innovation? It's the scroll. Like boom, 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 oh, stop. Boom, boom, boom. Like that, that. The, the idea that this is serendipitous discovery of something that's funny or interesting or sad or moving or whatever, or attractive, right? Um, and um, that is what show business used to be behind the scenes. And it just isn't that anymore. And I think they're going to, that's, that's going to be trouble. So what, so what changed? What, is it, is it, what created this new risk aversion or unwillingness to play the venture capital business? Success. Success is always what ruins you. Hmm. Right. Success is the thing that like, you know, you, I used to say the only way to be the number four network is you first have to be the number one network. Right. Hmm. Success is the worst thing possible because you think, oh, I, I figured it out instead of holy moly, got lucked out on that one. Um, and then when you, once you figure it out, then you realize that there are people who are like going to come knocking on your door and say, listen, we have five billion dollars we'd like to give you because you apparently know how to make hits. And you take the money because like somebody's telling you how smart you are. And then you make a bunch of movies that aren't very successful or, or, or you just double down on what the successes of the past, right? Why the superhero movies, why Marvel's successful. Th- that's one of the reasons why those things work. But, di- but this cycle is, is like re- re- recurred in Hollywood throughout the yeah. ages. Like what, but, but I, I don't know. I, I, it might be what, what we've discussed in our previous episode with um, Sarah Isger as like the arrogance of the present that, that is, taking hold of me, but it just feels like we're in this perpetual present, like we've somehow gotten to a loop where blockbusters are making money and they are the same. And it just feels like there is no escape from this horrible equilibrium. Yeah. I mean, there, there are some differences. One is like, you uh, for, just talk about the business, the, the entertainment industry as a whole. I mean, really until the late eighties, early nineties, really until distribution became a thing that people realized was going to explode. So right around the early, you know, 1995, say, um, <laughs> these companies operated on tiny, tiny, thin margins. They were always going broke or close to going broke. You know, you could, you could be a successful businessman and buy a studio 
you didn't need to go to a bank to buy it. Like it was a couple million. You could buy a studio. They bought and sold MGM. Um, Steve Ross ran a, a family uh, parking garages and funeral homes, I think, and then bought Warner Brothers. Like you, it, well, th these these were not considered great companies to own. There was no particular way you could make any money at them. Um, big companies, big corporations did dabble in it. Transamerica bought United Artists and hated it, tried to sell it like within six months. Coca-Cola owned Columbia Pictures for a long time. And when they sold it, they were like popping champagne in Atlanta in the boardrooms because they couldn't wait to get rid of this thing. Um, <laughs> they're not great companies like as a you know shareholder value. They just are containers for a lot of like crazy, crackpot, explosive, completely uncontained egos that somehow if you put together, they'll either kill each other or they're going to make a terrific picture, right? Or a great TV show. Um, and then everything else is going to like kind of go alongside it. I mean, we're, 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 the, 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 um, the problem with uh, all of this distribution that's happened is that it's turned, it's become very rational, which I think is a good thing in general, but never in the history of the entertainment business until really until Netflix has any company made money primarily by selling its content like you think the movie studios should be making all their money because the box office but it's not really true they make the money on the library they give half the money away from the box office they basically rent space in movie theaters or they used to and the movie theater owners kick back cash to them usually they take a little bit off the top and but the movie theaters make money because they sell a five cent box of milk duds for three dollars or a one and a half and one cent Coca Cola for two dollars. You know what I mean? That's like that's their that's how they make their money. Everyone has like TV networks don't really make money on the content. They make money on selling the time. The, the ad. Everyone has another side gig or two or three ways to squeeze dough out of this product. Only Netflix is saying if you give us X amount of money a month, we'll give you all the entertainment you want. And I am telling you, Netflix in 18, 24 months is going to suddenly say something like, okay, if you give us a lot of money, you don't have to watch ads. But if you give us just the little bit of money, you have to watch ads. They're going to have advertising on Netflix in any, any minute. Well, I was going to ask you about Netflix because it, at least theoretically, shouldn't it be something that allows content creators to kind of get potentially more like instant feedback on what's resonating with people in a way that like, I don't know, let's say you put up something that's a little bit more lower budget. If it finds an audience in Netflix, maybe then that it like, could, doesn't it have a potential to be a bit more like what the, what the, what the Hollywood model kind of aspired to be uh, potentially? Yeah. I mean, it could, I mean, the problem is that the stakes are so high, right? You're, 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 you're competing hugely with all these other people. And so you really don't, I mean, it's hard. You can't, it, Netflix can't get people to watch the shows they're making now with recognizable stars. So I don't know how they'd get you to watch something that you'd never heard of. That's what YouTube does. And YouTube's had a hard time connecting that piece to the other piece, right? Right now, there's like a gap, right? It should work the way you're describing. Everyone said it would work the way you're describing. Right. It doesn't. And I think partly one of the reasons it doesn't is because people, they're the last people, audiences are the last people you want to ask about what they want to watch. So I don't know, just something good. I mean, have you ever like, you know, you ever like had a group of five friends and you're trying to figure out what movie to see or where to go to dinner. And there's always that one really horrible, irritating friend who's like, Hey, I'm down for whatever. You're like no, just have a point of view. Just tell me. You're like I will go anywhere. I'm I'm scrolling through here, and usually that person's on. I'm down for whatever. And then you mention five places. Like well, not that. Not not. I don't. I don't want to. Do I did Thai yesterday. Uh, you know. I don't. Uh, Italian's too heavy. And you like <laughs> pick something. No, no. I'm down for whatever. Like that's your that's your audience. You just have to give them something great. And yeah. and there's no solution to it except you got to try. And then and the trouble happens when you start thinking to yourself well i could figure out i can get inside your brain and i can figure out what you think is great cuz how do you know i don't know just it's hard enough to do something that you enjoy let alone something you think 100,000 people are going to enjoy but that is definitely what's missed i mean you know that is definitely the secret people who have been very successful in show business that that's what they usually say when you ask them how do you decide what to do they're like well i make a movie that i would want to watch yeah
but didn't didn't the 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 Bob Iger era of Disney show that they kind of do know what you want to watch or at least what's going to get you your ass in a theater? Well, I mean, Iger is a really special kind of character. I I actually feel like Iger is the probably the smartest guy in show business, right? And one of the reasons is because I don't ha I have no idea what movies he likes. I mean, he doesn't show that. Um he did two things. He once he understood what a Disney movie was, and then he sort of built into made sh burnished into the workflow of a Disney movie what a Disney movie was. Not specifically it, just just what it was. Um, and he did the same thing for Pixar. Pixar is a really interesting company too because of their weird workflow where you can kind of stop a project at any time if it doesn't make any sense to you, which is something that no other movie theater movie studio can do. Like they, they absolutely, I need something to release in April, and Pixar is like, well, we don't know why these two are you know on that planet, so we're not gonna. So they, <laughs> they, they it's really weird, right? They're very weird. Um, but what he did was he collected a bunch of different you know, story worlds together and, and stood back and kind of like asked questions so that everybody doing them had to think their, their motivations through. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I don't really think he knows what people want to watch. I mean, they've had some, some things that didn't succeed. I just think that he has that, that, that company had the money and the management team and a person at the top in him who's basically, he's just, you know, like there are people who succeed in the entertainment business and they succeed because they are psychopaths that that actually is one of the, that's a huge, huge benefit to running a movie studio in a lot of ways or a big tech company, right? Steve jobs, not, he's a nut. Wasn't nut. Iger was able to sort of like be the orchestra conductor and he integrated, um, Marvel and all those egos and Apple and Pixar and Steve jobs and George Lucas and then his own team, and he managed to sort of like have them all playing really well together. I don't think anybody, and, and I think mostly because he, they never felt like he was trying to tell them how to do their job or what they are. Or any, and that, that's very, very special. It's a very, it, it, it shouldn't be, but I don't, I don't know any other executive who I felt quite have, have observed who's that smart, honestly. But managerial talent aside, he seems to have perfected the art of or at least like disney under him under his orchestration perfected the art of sucking an ip to the marrow and in in a successful way because it's not like the idea of you you know you you, you go back you to your um closet and pick up like your old dusty ips and try to revive them is a new idea but i i i don't think it's ever been done so so thoroughly so completely and so ad nauseumly as under disney <laughs> well i mean depends on like you're, if the audience or not i mean think about i mean i'm not the audience but disney manages to have you know as a hundred almost a century of content incredibly deep treasure of content and that really helps that gives you kind of a you know a north star to guide you like what what a disney movie is and what it isn't is really kind of important and i i think they're a unique brand for that i mean he, he, I guess my example is that you know, there, there are a lot of old names, right? Um, one of them is MGM. And MGM is bought and sold a million times, and the library has been pulled apart 10,000 times. And, um, and so you never, apparently, they, they had no idea that the company uh, a while ago was recapitalized. So that they, somebody came in and kind of cleaned up the balance sheet and got some money and kind of recapitalized the, the stuff. And one of their first <laughs> things was they needed to put, they needed to have some successes. They needed to show the town that they were still alive but they didn't know what they owned <laughs> because it was too complicated. But there was, and a friend of mine was running it at the time. And he said that there was an older woman there who was, she was the, the studio librarian. Like a lot of studios have this and only she knew what really they still had. And so he asked her to, um, to come and show him what they had. And so she came into his office in the morning and on his floor, he had this big office. On his floor, she laid like one sheets and t t and, and and pictures and like uh, just titles and stuff. That's the beginning the of a horror movie called yeah, uh, yeah. Studio <laughs> Librarian. Yeah, and like had a little pathway through it, and she walked him through this in the morning. This is what we own. This is what we own. Here's some things you've never heard of that we own. Some of the titles are really great. Um, and then and then one of the titles was Silence of the Lambs. And he said, "Do we own that?" She said, "Well, no." 
because we sold it and bought it and sold it again. We don't own Hannibal Lecter. And we don't own the search for Hannibal Lecter. But we do own Clarice Starling. But not if she's going after Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> and it's unclear whether, in a, if we ever did anything with the, the character Clarice Starling, if we could ever have her say something like, hey, remember when I went after Hannibal you, That's unclear, <laughs> right? That's a legal issue. You have to pay for that. And so he sat there at his desk. He thought, well, you know, wait a minute. I know that there's a TV network, I think it was Lifetime at the time, that's looking for darker female lead led uh, mysteries. So he called a person up and said, hey, uh, how about a show called Special Agent Clarice Starling? They go, we're in. Yes. But, but here's the thing. It can't have anything to do with Hannibal Lecter. And they're like, okay, that's fine. And then he went there the next week and he had a pitch for them and they bought it. And that was like... But that's like the weird way you thread the needle through your library. Like, what do you own? What don't you own? Is this, I, and, and look, in, in a, a 10,000 channel universe, when your audience basically can watch anything at any time, a little edge like that, like, oh, I, I know who that character is. That can make all the difference. That and a star can make all the difference. So th you're saying that that's, that's really the more viable route than just paying someone new to create something new? <laughs> yeah, because it sounds like a really hard process. <laughs> something. Think about something new. Is it's, it's it's new. Like I don't know. Does it work? Like if you're the studio head, you're like, I, I, it's new. I've never heard of this before. And you're like, yeah, I know. You you want new ideas? No, no, we don't want new ideas. We want old ideas that are new. Which is, I, I uh, this is a digressive story. A friend of mine is an older uh, comedy writer. When he's a very young comedy writer. Um, he uh, met the, Jackie Gleason's manager. Jackie Gleason at that point was a you know, comedy star, but his show was over, and he was basically doing nightclub acts in Miami Beach. And so the guy said, he needs, he's always screaming at me, he needs new material. I like your jokes. Come down to Miami Beach and sit with Jackie. And so this guy, he wrote all these jokes that he thought were Jackie Gleason-style jokes. And they got on, he got on the train, it was a train back then, down to Miami Beach, he gets in the hotel, there's the Fontainebleau or something. And the manager's there to meet him in the lobby. He goes, Look, let's go upstairs. They go upstairs, and there's Jackie Gleason in his robe, you know, looking at the beach, and turns around, and the manager says, Jackie, here's this young comedy writer. He's written some stuff for you. So Gleason kind of, like, scowls and grabs the cards and reads the cards, and, like, gets more and more confused as he's reading the cards, like, more and more angry. And he goes, what is this? I've never read these jokes before. And the manager goes, no, right, they're new. It's new material. Like, you said you want new material. He goes, I, I, I don't want new material. I don't want material I've never read before. Get me some old material. <laughs> and he sort of handed the stuff back to the manager, which of course it makes no sense at all unless you're that guy and you're like, I don't want to go out there and risk anything. Hmm. I want you to give me old material that no one's heard before. Well, okay. At some point, you're going to have to risk it. Or, or fade. But risking it is really hard to do if you're, you know, you're in a big company and you're like this guy from AT&T is calling you about your quarterly, you know, or Ryan Roberts from Comcast. Like, it's hard. Like, I don't know. Like, uh, how do you know? Like, I got to risk it. And risk is something that people are much, 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 much more averse to now than they ever were. So, and why? And so that's the question. Why? Uh, yeah. You think, you think that with all this like tech money like rolling in uh, and, and theoretically tech like tech people should be more likely to take i mean taking risks you take risks on software it's so much less of a risk than taking a risk on something that's actually like out in the physical world but theoretically there's like a whole vc world out there that is all about like risk taking high return high risk and you think that yeah and, and not just the, the the vc money itself just a vc mentality and where where why doesn't why, why aren't we seeing it well, one reason is because there's no, the VC mentality is, I mean, a friend of mine is a very, very, very successful venture capitalist. And he said, look, this is how he decides what he's going to put money into. They, they, you know, they get together and they, they, him and his partners and they're, you know, <coughs> not, you know, the managing partners and the um, associates, and they come up with a couple of core theses for where they think the world is going, where they think the consumer is going, where they think tech is going. And then they decide, okay, well, let's, we're going to fund things that are in that screen, right? So we're not going to fund stuff that's outside of our, Set of our set of hypotheses, and we're and we're going to fund stuff that if it succeeds, the world's different. And so you know they're operating at a different level. If it if if uh, if Facebook succeeds, if Coinbase succeeds, if these things succeed, the world's different. You know if my TV show succeeds, the world's not different. 
right? I mean, depends on the TV show, no? Depends on the TV. Uh, well, maybe you're right, but it's not different. Like you know, it's like it's a good TV show. People enjoy it. But it's not different. So it's hard to get. It's you know, it's like the risk is so the risk is not as high as it is to like fund a company, and there are many many ways where you can jump off the 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 the, the you know you can make a you can write a script, you can make a pilot, you can shoot six episodes, you can do a lot of things before you're like in deep. But the ultimately you can't. And even the VCs I know think they know. I mean, there's really nobody. I mean, anybody. I mean, yeah, it is true. The studio chiefs and people, executives, that all all description are really, really arrogant. Nobody's as arrogant as a venture capitalist, in my experience. <laughs> nobody will tell you exactly what's going to happen on Tuesday uh, with more authority and less actual accuracy than a venture capitalist. They'll tell you what you should be eating, how you should get paid, how, where you should put that chair in your office. They know everything. And they only have to succeed one out of 10 times. <laughs> That's pretty good. Has there ever been a, a, a period in Hollywood or in, I don't know, in creative content creation, whatever you want to call it, in which there was a business model that successfully rewarded creativity? Well, I mean, I don't know. Cre I mean, creativity is rewarded in, in a lot of different, di different ways. I mean, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, I, I, I have friends of mine who, are, um, who want to have creative freedom to make a $200 million movie, which, you know, if you want to have the creative freedom to make a $200 million movie, you have to start with, you have, you have to have $200 million, right? <laughs> and then you have to ask people for money, then you're not, you're, you're not going to do it. So, so the outs, you know, the, the, the benefit of the ways we tell stories now, which includes, you know, things like on the iPhone and TikTok and all sorts of things, is that the audience has shown its flexibility. You just have to have something to say to them. You have a story you want to tell. And if you're, Always telling them the same story, which is aliens are going to come in and take the superheroes' special, you know, gemstones away. It's like, okay, I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to run in for that. I know people who are. I'm just this is me personally. So you have to be willing to sort of tell stories and like you know, and the more specific, the better. I mean, that part of I mean, I know I know I'm as as a, as a you know middle aged white guy. I know a lot of my middle aged white guy contemporaries are complaining a lot about. Well, you know, it's all about diversity now, so no one's going to hire me. And I kind of understand that, sort of, but I also kind of think, well, wait a minute. I mean, the more specific the stories you tell, the more interesting they are to the wider group of people. It's like the, when, you, when you actually try to appeal to a bunch of people by telling a universally understood story, you end up, like, boring everybody. But if you tell a really specific story that you let the audience and your, your reader or your viewer kind of extrapolate from that, I mean, what? I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Of the three people on this podcast, I don't think, was, were any, have any of you been in the mob? <laughs> right? You no, know, but like the mob story, like that's oh, sort of interesting, right? It's not, not interesting because it's a different world. It's interesting because like, oh, I, you know what? You know what? God, that reminds me of my dad. I mean, or, Fiddler on the Roof was wildly successful in Japan. Yeah, right. But what was that all about? But it was super specific, right? And in Japan, they have matchmakers and stuff. They understand the, I mean, human beings are the same. So it's not like we, you don't have to, you don't ha ever have to make the argument to people that we're the same. We kind of know we're the same. Uh, yeah, the, the universality is intrinsic to the individual. You don't need to make the individual generic in yeah, order to like, give them you know, broad yeah. applicability. I mean, and, like, and also, like, remember that part of what you do when you're looking at the, at the screen, part of it is wish fulfillment. And I want, I mean, there are a lot of people who are now 30 for whom the idea of watching, when we talk about friends, watching friends was when they were in their you know, high school or even junior high. They're like, that's the life I want to live. I'm, I'm going to be a young person in New York City with my, with my friends, and it's going to be great. And that had a huge effect on people. The, the audience for friends wasn't just young people. It was like very young people who just, just fantasized about, well, that's going to be like being in the city. So there's that too. And I think some of the fantasy parts of it, some of the, I don't know, the exorcism parts of it, you know, the 70s, which were uh, this decade where everybody had this, Incredible acid indigestion from the '60s. The culturally, there's the assassinations and the whole thing, and the my satanic killings, and like, oh man, horrible. Watergate, and Vietnam, like the whole country was like having this. Ugh. And TV and what characters said on TV was one of the ways we worked it out. I I still think that the, the in, in reality a lot of the like we are the way you're describing it, we're almost expecting the uh, current reality of marvel movies to flop because because they're too generic they're too, they nobody can see themselves in it no and i don't know if anybody actually wants to see themselves in it so neither wish fulfillment nor relatability will you find 
but they work. Is it just? Is it all just the Chinese market? Is that? Is that? Is that? No, all no. Is? I mean, look. I think they work. I mean, they, they, they. But even you know, but, but to how? I mean, they work at an extremely high expensive level. They work as a spectacle, uh, as a spectacle, and they work as a uh, currently as a way to get you to pay for Disney Plus or for HBO <laughs> Max or something, right? That could change. I mean, this is all just this could all change. But that's how they work, and then whether they're going to work for. I mean, that if that's the case, then it's really. It's a very specific product with a very specific uh, distributorship, and um, you know, really, that point oh 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 one percent of the show business constellation is involved in that. And if that is where movies and TV go, there's no room for anything else. And that that it'll be either you're watching a two hundred million, three hundred million dollar movie in which you know the sun explodes, uh, or you're watching basically a YouTube video. Um, so you said earlier, um, way earlier, we we, talk, we started talking about the question of truth. So let's go back to craft. And I, I wanted to ask you immediately then, and obviously I postponed it for, for like 30 minutes. Can you <laughs> give me an example of a place where you feel, where you se- see this absence of truth? Oh, yeah, television. Everything on that screen. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that everything on that screen has a kind of a weird, not of this world quality. It's either kind of, quirky and soft or interesting. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, or uh, kind of a fantasy, a lot of fantasy, or straight on, straight up, you know, genre, procedural drama or, you know, young adult drama. But none of it looks like the artistic version of pe- what people scream about to each other uh, who hate each other because you're not wearing a mask or because you are wearing a mask. And um, I miss that. I miss that. I mean, that, that, you know, most television in the 50s and 60s and 70s was that. Most, a lot of huge number of the great movie, American movies were that. But the greatest American movie, in my opinion, the, the, the finest movie ever made is the movie called The Best Years of Our Lives. 1946, William Wyler tells the story of three soldiers coming home from World War II uh, at a time when everyone was a soldier coming home from World War II. And one guy, you know, uh, it was a, it's kind of had a like class ca- class realism and 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 uh, uh, PTSDs in there and like everything's in there. All of America, American experience in 1946 is in there, and it's a terrific movie. And it's like it's the, the script is fantastic and the, everything's great. You watch it now and it has it, it 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 is super effective now. It feels really modern, and you know that's what. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be like a Pollyanna here, but that, that is the thing that we're supposed to be doing. It, we're not, it's not supposed to be an opium den where you go and you do your, have your little experience and then you were sort of catatonic for an hour, two hours, three hours. I mean, like if you look at young people in a room together on like scrolling their phones on TikTok, that is an opium den. That's what that looks like. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of hoping for something better. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is, though, that you... And, and, and I'm saying this from, from a point of agreement, actually, but the, the, you do get like this ambient political undertone in a lot of the, the shows that you, we watch today, but it's kind of vapid and doesn't yeah, really, yeah. And, and, and it seems like to be, you know, an artifice. Like it doesn't feel like a real political engagement it's not it's not it's, like you said it's not what re- people are really screaming about it's just right, something right. else and i just I, I don't know if you can help point out what i'm missing oh, well it's it's like honesty is what it is it's like uh, uh, you know that stuff now is on tv because they're trying to they're it's like therapy they're trying to get you to change your behavior but if you <laughs> watch you know dave Chappelle, he doesn't care what you think he's just up there observing stuff and it's incredibly hilarious but there is no reason, I mean, Dave Chappelle is extremely talented, but there's no reason why he should be somehow have that all to himself. Like, why should Dave Chappelle be the only person who is allowed to make jokes about America and race and class and growing up and violence? And like, it seems crazy to me. I mean, I think it seems crazy to Dave Chappelle. So mm-hmm. I, I, but the, but the, the people who are, who used to do that and used to like be tasked with that. I mean, you know, Norman Lear put on All the Family in the early 70s and the CBS is they, 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 they told him deal with all the stuff happening in the world. Hmm. I mean, how, do you have any do you have any friends who are like 
I'm not recycling. I'm not separating this shit. Like, it's all good. <laughs> I mean, I, I have friends like that. Yeah. In New York, you have to separate it. Like, yeah, I don't know. Nobody on TV ever says that. Ever. Ever. I mean, nobody on TV ever says anything that's even remotely similar to anything that we say in our in unguarded moments to our friends. I like, I know, I know you're not going to hate me, but blah, 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 blah. Then we say that. And we did, you know, nobody says on TV ever, ever. They, they talk about something else. They talk about dating or some other boring thing. They will never talk about the stuff that when you're sitting around with your friends and you're like, you know, I really think some of the homeless people in my neighborhood are insane. You can't say that on TV. Even though you and I know that some people, I'm not saying all of them, but some of the homeless people in my neighborhood are insane. Is it, Adam and I have been oh, recently watched um, Bo Burnham's Inside. I'm not sure if you've seen Oh, yeah. It. No, I haven't seen it. But here's, it's funny, right? He's, he's a funny guy, I guess. Yeah, he's a funny guy, but he's constantly towing this line of what he's he's supposed to say mm -hmm. and and how he's supposed to be in terms of kind of, he. I think, I think one of the lines is like, in one of the songs is like, made some content, daddy gave you some content, just kind of like playing into that. Like he knows what he's supposed to do. He's a content creator and he knows he's supposed to keep you not just entertained, but in that opium den sense of right. I am not engaging with the world. I am I am in fact out of the world because it's, I'm not, it's all like surface level and light. And he's constantly attempting to teeter totter between that state of being and the, the kind of more, you know, darker, real kind of, uh, elements of of our current moment and like the zeitgeist you know it's, adam and i differ on how well he does it and to what extent he kind of gets a little too emo or, or actually like realistically grapples with our current moment but i do think it's a really interesting example of of someone mm -hmm. who's a creative person in this industry who knows what he's supposed to do and keeps bucking against it in a way that i think is very gratifying and he's one i think he's the only only artist i can think of that has successfully captured the zeitgeist of 2020 in a creative format yeah, that may be. I mean, he, you know, and he, of course, is famously a YouTube star. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. One, one of these areas where he's especially ambiguous about, like, you can't tell what he's actually uh, thinking or what side he falls on, which seems to be an intentional sort of opacity, um, kind of like uh, at Tim Minchin's uh, The Fence. One of the topics where this ambivalence is really strong is the very question of what am I allowed to talk about? And he has a few songs that address that directly, and I actually got into debates with with a friend about well, like is he is he being pro cancel culture? Is he being anti cancel culture? Is what, what is he was he actually saying? And the fact that I still don't know for sure is really refreshing. It's really yeah. uh, in itself is is a great thing in, in in this moment. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I used to love about All in the Family, as I've now mentioned seventeen times. I mean, I was a child on his own, just to be fair. I'm not ancient, but. It, that it was a show that was produced and written by people with a very specific point of view. And it was designed to depict a certain, you know, a, 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 an American family in 1972, which uh, at, at the head of the household was a, you know, an incredibly anachronistic, bigoted, small minded, working class white guy. And that was the goal, right? We're going to show that for what it is. And, they depicted that small-minded, bigoted, working-class white guy really, really well. Lives in Queens, right? Where else? Yeah, where else? What they didn't expect was that he'd become the star and the hero of the show. Hmm. Where people watching the show kind of forgave him that. For one thing, because he like fought in World War II, but also because he had two jobs. Because his like, hmm. feckless son-in-law, who was not supposed to be feckless, was just supposed to be the liberal sort of voice of the, of the family, it didn't work. He was in some stupid school studying some stupid stuff that didn't matter and so the head of the household had to go work on the docks as a longshoreman and also as a, drive a taxi cab at night and the the tension there was incredibly successful because they didn't really you know they tried to guess to put their thumb on the scale but it didn't really work and i think that's the most interesting stuff like that's the the chief benefit of writing a scripted TV show is that you don't have to have a conclusion. You don't have to know the answer. You just have to have characters that you believe have that conversation or have that conflict. You don't have to resolve it. Like in life, things aren't resolved. People 
in your family or in your friend group disagree and then they go away and they're either friends again or they're just, they don't speak or they're whatever, but they don't, there's no res- resolution. No one ever come. That's the weirdest things. Like nobody said, like, has anyone in Twitter ever said, you know, after you tweeted all that nasty crap at me and screamed at me, I have really come to believe that you're right. You've changed. No one ever says that. You can change your mind. You just kind of clash and then go to your corners and, and your friends tell you, you won. And then you, Move on. The next day, there's someone else in the ring. You don't have the scene where where the person who attacked you comes back to you and finds you in the in the locker room and puts their <laughs> hands on your shoulder and says, "Like you know, we're good. We're good." Or, or you know what? I did I did read that article <laughs> you linked to, and you're correct. <laughs> no one ever says that. Uh, I I think my oh in the family was um, Boston Legal. I don't remember how oh, yeah. much I enjoyed seeing those characters getting into verbal fencing oh about ideology and politics and you had james spader as the bush bashing liberal and and shatner as the gun toting conservative and there was both love and hate but they also talked about real things that that, that you knew the stakes were real so when you saw them at the end of the episode sitting on a balcony drinking scotch together when nothing was really resolved, you'd realize that you're watching a model for living in and with disagreement. And because of this conceit, I would often find myself coming out of an episode thinking, wow, wait, this is something that I didn't actually consider fully. I didn't really appreciate the whole complexity of this story. Maybe it was a little too arrogant Hmm. in my view about this issue. It is interesting, isn't it? It's like, a, I feel like that's part of, um, I don't know whether that's a human experience or not, which is the, the, uh, the unwillingness to sort of, to be convinced. Like you hold on to something and it's, if, if, and if it's part of your, deeply part of your, um, you know, ego construct, it's really hard for you to like say, oh yeah, that's, I guess I was wrong about uh, the infected fatality rate of COVID uh, uh, non-vaccinated people in Miami-Dade County. Like, you, it's a hard thing to, like, just because, like, everything's, like, no, no, it's all wrapped up in one big thing. So there are people who are, people who are getting the vaccine because they, they hate Trump. And there are people who are not getting the vaccine because they love Trump. And it's, like, this is the weirdest thing ever. Like, what, Trump has nothing to do with the vaccine. Like, I can't think of anybody less involved in the development or research of the COVID vaccine than Donald Trump. I mean, you know, of, you know, aside from us, because I wouldn't there, like, it, like the idea that this is a thing that you're wearing, like you absolutely desperately need to wear these things as your badge of identity is so strange, especially when we seem to be like, have a million ways to assert our identity all the time. Like if you, mm-hmm. if you really were describing the modern moment and maybe I'm just rambling. Um, at no point would you say there no, is no evidence that people are being animized or hidden away. Like, if I give you an iPhone, you spend half an hour personalizing it. Like, your Facebook feed is yours. Your Twitter feed is yours. All these ads are yours. Like, it, there's no shortage of ways that you can prove that you're an individual. And yet, we're now we, we keep collecting them. Like, it's just strange to me. It's like, what do you care? Like, I don't know. Just, like... Maybe it maybe it makes sense. Like in, in the in the in the moment where the human ego is at its most fully expressed, it's never been more fully expressed now than than, than ever than, than at any point before now, right? There's never been a moment in human history when your individual ego has has been less prominent and less expressed. And yet all people are terrified of right now is like making sure that I don't wear the mask so that you don't think that I'm somebody who I'm not. But I think it's exactly, but if, if, if I were to guess, and I will, I'll join your rambling, like it's the, exactly <laughs> the response to that totality of the egoism. Like we talked about with Marvel or with you know, film, when you make things too generic, they apply to no one. And when you make everything about your like, hyper-individualism and ego, then you start realizing that your individualism means nothing if it's not in relation or tension or comparison to and with other people. And that's what people are grasping for when they are deciding not to wear a mask or to make a whole show about taking the vaccine or not right. taking the vaccine or hating aggressively the people who do or don't. 
What they're saying is, I do belong somewhere. It's not about my identity as an individual. It is about me being part of something in which I can find a bedrock of identity and relate to others. I've so lost the ability to create an actual meaningful structure of relationships in the real world that this is where I find it. This is where I find some sort of meaningful, emotionally satisfying tribe. And yet, why is that? That doesn't seem normal to me. It seems like weirdly virtual. Like, what's the point? Like, there are zero benefits of being part of that tribe. There's just zero benefits to it. What are, the, what are the benefits? You're not the benefits of being part of a tribe are like, you know, people like, you know, you go to a hospital, they'll come visit you. They'll yeah. like write you notes and they'll, you know, like, will you please let my dog out? I ha- can't go. Oh, that's, but that's a tribe, that's a neighborhood. That's like actually valuable. Those are people you want to invest in. I think a p- something has, has, you know, eroded people's ability to create the normal tribes. And they are, they, and they're starting to build it in ways that really don't make sense. They are just more readily available. Because clearly, we still have that innate evolutionary desire to to build connections, but we've just atrophied completely the muscle responsible for for making them. Like, no, maybe, maybe, maybe. Just put the phone just for a sec for just a minute, <laughs> and, and you know, oh, maybe, maybe instead of going on Twitter, respond to the friend that I've been ghosting on on WhatsApp and tell them, you know, right. what, I will meet you for a glass of wine. But what we all know ends up happening in this fucked up psychological loop. We can't stop doom scrolling. We right. ignore the person inviting us out, but then feel lonely about it. Right. And then right. lament it and try to figure out, like, why, yeah, why and are we or, so lonely? And or pl- scroll on Instagram or TikTok for 45 minutes instead of choosing the piece of art that might actually touch your soul and make you think. Have you ever done this? this like, I, I do this now, unfortunately, more often than I like to, I like to admit. You're on you're like TikTok or something or Instagram, and then suddenly you just throw the phone away. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I just yeah. get this thing to fuck away from me. <laughs> and yeah. I really yeah. do feel like that is opium den behavior where you're yeah. like, well, I, I just, I'm aware that I need to get out of here. And yeah. um, also kind of aware that none of it is, none of it is meaningful. None of it is real. It's all kind of virtual. Whereas the real stuff, and the irony about it is the real stuff is so much easier. It's so much easier mm-hmm. to, um, yeah. to live a wor- a, in a world where you're with people and that even people you disagree with and that you can forgive. And, and I think part of what I, what I, what I despair about sometimes I, when I hear stories of people who bring that kind of crazy uh, brinksmanship, all or nothing, you know, set of judgments that are everywhere online and they bring them to their real life. And that to me is like a tragedy. There's like a the theory, I forget who, like somebody probably, I forget, I'm sure it's somebody smarter, definitely smarter, smarter than me, came up with the idea of like zeroism. Hmm. Like zeroism or like, like I, I will only accept this solution if it, has zero consequences, <laughs> zero trade-offs. So, like, you find that now with COVID, a lot of people like, like, you'll be talking to somebody about COVID, and they'll be like, "Well, you know, eleven people are in the hospital now in Washington D.C. because of COVID." It's like, well, okay, that's bad, but I mean, should you think it should be zero? Because it's never going to be zero, right? We understand it'll never be zero. We'll all get the vaccine, and it will still never be zero. Well, these vaccines don't work. Well, they do work. It just is not if the standard is zero, like you, you really think your mom or your dad is going to be 0% offensive to you politically. They're going to be <laughs> zero transphobia. You think that there's going to be zero, really zero. You're going for zero. I mean, Oh, I, good luck. Like it's going to be a ha- awful, what's a hard life to live. And that's, I think, I mean, just to bring it full circle is like that. I think is what we're supposed to do in drama and in comedy is like, Make fun of the zero people hmm. because they're, you can't live that way. And in <laughs> drama, if you write it right and you write it and it's interesting, the show's interesting, you end up with a very, very non-zero attitude. And that, I think, is... And these are exactly the people that you can't make fun of. They're every- yeah, well, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> they don't want that, <laughs> I, which I understand. Like, I, I completely get it. Like, if I, uh, absolutely, because it's just too easy. But, you know, I, a friend of mine told me once, and it depends on what, what I guess, your generation. That um, from like 70, you know, I don't know, 75, we'll say, r- roughly, 75 to, you know, 2021, gay rights movement became a thing and then became, uh, then was like attached to the sort of the, the AIDS crisis 
and um, had all sorts of political movements and sub movements um, and people, you know, I'm, you know, marching and whatever, you know, good stuff. Right. Um, but nothing quite had the power of will and grace, the TV show will and grace, which, you know, was okay, but kind of got crazy near the end. And the, the, re the, 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 the reboot was terrible. And, but what I mean is they just told a story. And so if you were a zeroist, you were going to, you're not going to like it on either side. You weren't going to like it. Um, but if you're just a normal person, just like, ah, oh, you know, worked hard today and I, you know, sat down and like had dinner and then you turn on the TV and you want to laugh and then you watch the show that's really specific that you have nothing in common with these people who live in New York city and are like living this weird life that you can't even relate to. I don't know. Maybe that was more effective than a million billion op-eds and a million billion marches on Washington. I, conversely, there, I, I really don't think there's anything that turns you off of an idea more than propaganda. When you feel, <laughs> right, right. And, and that's what drives me crazy about the current state of late night television. It's just... Yeah, that's too bad, right? It's just weak. It's just, it's not, you're, I, I am on your, keep me on your side. Don't, don't lose me. Don't antagonize me. Don't make me, don't make me resent having been raised on, on, you know, quote unquote, liberal values as defined in Europe, at least, but not what you Americans would call liberal values, which I think are slightly different. Very different. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. Um, I remember this is like 2000, this is 2015, maybe, uh, when Jon Stewart was still on the Daily Show. Maybe that was what it was. I can't remember. Or maybe it was even earlier than that. Uh, maybe it was 2007. And he made a joke about Hillary Clinton. And there was like this sharp intake of breath in the, in the audience. He looked at them and he goes, well, you know, you guys are going to have to get ready for this. Because the current president's leaving and she's, you know, he, that's the point people thought that she'd be the next president. Like, he, but you could see on his face that he was, he was like, oh no, you guys, you guys are not ready for me to make jokes about people that you like. Hmm. And, you know, I think, I mean, probably that had, I think that had a lot to do with one of the reasons why he decided to leave. Like, I nah, did it already. Like, you know, it's, you know, that, that is a problem with advocacy that is dressed up as stand up comedy. No matter who does it. Yeah. It's just not funny. It's just not funny. Like, there's nothing funny about it. I mean, that's, it's fine. It says an op ed. I guess it's great. You know, you can make a political argument, but it's, it ain't funny. It's not going to be funny. But I mean, but it is, I guess it is funny for the people who, I just, I just, it feels to me like they're talking to a very specific segment of, of the U.S. And for those folks who are still enjoying it and consuming it, um, for me personally, who uh, I would consider myself part of the, the liberal tribe and, and I know that this is being directed at me and I used to find it funny, but now that I've been doing this podcast for a while and I've been introduced to a lot of different viewpoints, I can now, it's hard for me to laugh anymore because I can feel how exclusionary the language is. And it's, it, it's kind of extraordinary when you think about like late night TV is supposed to be for everybody. Like it's supposed to be something that everyone can come around and be like, Hey, did you see that bit? Whatever. Um, and it seems like it's only talking to one one part of America it, at this point. It's exclusionary and patronizing in a in a in, a, in the same time. In a, in the same time. time. And it's just like yeah. I, I just remember a point that I think I think I I, I probably Vanessa and I probably talked about uh, separately. Vanessa was watching uh, John Oliver in, in in secretly in her room, but I could still hear the the, the noise coming out. And he there was a point where he was talking about I think uh, unemployment. Unemployment. Thank you. Unemployment. And early on in the clip, he says with his educator voice, you know. <laughs> Different states have different unemployment benefits. And that's something you might want to consider before moving to another state. And I was just listening and thinking, first, how condescending to your audience you can be. But also, yeah, that's why millions of Californians have moved to Texas. They opted for a government that takes less money from you and gives you less and stays out of your way. Supposedly, of course, because obviously Republicans become very handsy when, when it's their top culture war issues, like critical race theory or not wearing masks. But, but the point remains when it comes to John Oliver. I don't know. I was just thinking this. How is this not right. insulting to his own viewers? Right. But he's mad. He's mad at them. That's ultimately the problem with all this stuff is like the, the, the people who you, you really aren't, who you really are mad at are, are the, your viewer. He's mad. That so many people are leaving California and going to a place like Texas. That's what that is about. 
And like, well, are, are, you know, maybe you, you morons want to look and see what the policy is mm. on something that he cares about before you go move to tech. He's mad that they're doing that. They're not supposed to. They're, 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 they're misbehaving. And he can't fathom yeah. that this is exactly the reason that they are leaving. Yeah, I mean, that is, is ultimately the, yeah, that is ultimately the problem with whatever the dominant culture is, right? That whatever the dominant culture is, they just they get mad at you for like not conforming. Like, stop it. Like, stop. <laughs> stop being a jerk. Like, ob obey obey um and you see that on the right too i know a lot of people on the right who um just simply didn't didn't get with the trump business or they were very they didn't like it they didn't like him i mean I'm, are, I was, are there yeah i mean i'm pretty outspoken i mean i didn't like him i mean i hated okay, him i'm kidding but uh, yeah and their the response from their own side was things like hey can you just shut up about it hey just get on the get on the team like they're mad mm -hmm. at you for saying things like, well, you know, you know, he, he didn't really do anything with China, by the way. Oh, shut up. Like he did, too. He tweeted or whatever. Right. <laughs> like the, the, the need, which is very strange to me, the need to uh, to to uh, like, I understand, I guess, the need to be part of a tribe that's big and complicated and eternal, you know, like. Um. I understand, like, uh, I'm an Anglican. I get that. Like, okay, that's a complicated series of doctrin doctrinal stuff that you got to follow and whatever. But I'm a Democrat or a Republican. What does that even mean? That's like, crazy. Like, that's <laughs> like, what? That's just a meaningless word that doesn't, like, are you, like, it, why would you, it's like saying I'm, I'm somebody who will always root for the Walmart. Yeah, or the American League East. Like what? It's like what do you like? There's nothing specific about it, and I think it's all designed to like. Well, I don't want to be forgotten. I don't want to be overlooked. Whereas I think in the past, Americans in general have um, made it kind of fetish about being overlooked. Like if you'd said to somebody in 1950, like, "What do you want more than anything?" Like, I want you to leave me alone. Literally, <laughs> leave me alone, and in return, I will leave you alone. Whereas I think most Americans now are like, I want you to leave me alone. But meanwhile, I'm going to get it, get it inside your business. And I'm really going to like look and see what you like. Everybody's such a busybody now. Like that it, 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 it's not America in the in the traditional sense of what America was, which has got this robust sort of we're on our own. And, you know, and, and we come together once a week in the movie theater to laugh at the same thing or to cry at the same thing or to cheer for the, you know, whatever the cowboy. Now it's I don't know what it is now. It's very, <laughs> it's very weird. It's like I, what I my. Uh, I, I've been doing all this reading about uh, in psycho psychoanalysis and Freud and Jung the past couple of years. And like, I, it's hard for me to see the world as anything other than that. But it really does <laughs> seem to me that the, that the America is having this kind of weird neurotic anxiety attack. And that what really needs Ativan, like everybody needs Ativan for a while just to simmer down. And then when that wears off, we can maybe come back into the public square when we're not like so weirdly offended and itchy and like, you know, oversensitive because if you actually say, I said this at a dinner party last week, and, and I've, it was as if I had said something controversial. I said, well, you know, now, even now, post-COVID, it's the best time to be alive on the planet. Right now, hmm. like, everything's great right now. This is the, oh my God, like, America is in fantastic shape right now. The world is in unbelievable shape. Like, we should be celebrating. And people look at me like, are you kidding me? And then they had something like, well, what about, and they found some small thing to come. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying everything's <laughs> perfect. I'm not a zeroist. Everything's not perfect. But like, God, like, can you imagine that? I mean, I, the statistic I always use is, we can talk about other things too, but, or you can, I can just shut up too, by the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Um, is like, if you had gone back in time and told people in America that in the future, in 2021 in America, poor people will be fat. They'd look at you like, are you insane? What kind of world is it where poor people are fat? Poor people have never been fat in the history of Earth. Poor people have, were, the only time poor people got fat, the poor people started getting fat around 1960. Like that's in, on Earth when they got fat. Everything, I, I, when you saw a person, a skinny person walking down the street in 1952, that person was poor. And if you saw a fat guy walking down the street in 1952, that guy was rich. Like even the cartoons of the times, like rich fat cats with their monocles and their top hats, busting out of their oh, yeah, waistcoats. That's exactly the opposite. It's exactly the opposite. And just for the record, it's worth emphasizing that for 
the the poor processed food also brought a whole new host of problems which is malnutrition and obesity and diabetes and heart problems and other complications associated with generally unhealthy diets but these are dwarfed by the specter that loomed over human existence since the dawn of civilization which is starvation so while there are clearly many remaining points of inequality in the realm of diet the fact that calories just getting calories is not one of them is such an historically radical revolution and by the way this is exactly why historically it's been uh fashionable in paintings and art to depict the affluent as sumptuous being able to fill your body was a status symbol then suddenly in the 20th century this flips because now you show your status by eating kale and quinoa which is the ugly mirror of poor people not having access to more nourishing healthy food and instead relying on shit food for subsistence i mean and that is a that is a, that is a, a an unfortunate side effect of enormous wealth you know it just made me remember that this movie that i watched recently and by recently i mean sometime in the past two years because since lockdown what what is time and it's like something from the 40s i forgot the name and you have it's, it's about a populist leader in the, the 19 late 30s or early 40s an american populist politician and you see him in his early days, this this figure who will become the this demagogue, and he's with his family in a little rural house, and he's poor, yeah. and he and his wife are talking about whether or not they're going to have enough food to last the winter, <laughs> and you're watching it, and yeah, because famines were a thing in the 1940s. Yeah, people were people were hungry. Yeah. And this was an aside in the story. It was not the heart of it because it was just taken for granted at the time. Uh, how can you say, how can you, how can you even entertain the thought that things have not materially improved? Yeah. I do. I want to go back to this idea though of this, like the, the worldview kind of giving you creative blind spots, I guess. Um, and I'm thinking about, I mean, you wrote that, um, essay response to, to the Dolly Parton podcast, which I found really interesting oh, yeah, yeah, right. because, cause I loved that, po- oh, me <laughs> that too, podcast. Me too. I, I was a big too, yeah. fan. Um, but, but I, the point that you made that I thought was really interesting was like <laughs> the narrators just can't really can't grapple with Dolly as, as a person that just, it, it's like, it's like they can't, because she's a kind of at odds with the way they see the world. They just can't seem to quite. Um, like the way that they narrate and explain her is always like, but surely it's actually this, you know, because this is the way we think. And Dolly's always like, well, n- well, no, I have a different point of view. And yet like the way that they frame her is always like trying to like make her fit a bit. And I do think it gives them a bit of a blind spot to understand like what it's that's actually appealing about, about Dolly, which I think is what you were trying to say. In yeah. That, that she's in that a complicated essay. person and she's, uh, and, and that in order for you to admire her, and for and I do like and to think that she is in many ways a great American and probably should be on the ten dollar bill. She doesn't have to be. She doesn't have to echo all of your beliefs in the language and the words that you would use. So the the, the first time they have a freak out is when she says, "Oh, because I don't really think of myself as a feminist," and they really have like a mental breakdown. Like they they <laughs> they, they they can't contain. They can't. They, they actually stop talking about her a while because they're just yeah. too traumatized by that and they end up interviewing a lot of telling stories of a lot of other women who have nothing to do with dolly parton who do think of themselves as feminists which is very weird it's very sort of uh, my opinion i don't know offense very millennial thing which is like mm-hmm. i don't like the way this is going so i'm going to start talking about myself and how i feel which is what they do for like an hour and then they come back to her and they're so anguished that well wait a minute now here's this woman and she says she's a feminist you mm-hmm, feminist mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and we think of you as this and this and this and this and this. So why why wouldn't you be a feminist? And so Dolly Parton does the thing that you do when you're a polite person. She says, well, if you if it's important to you, okay, fine, I'm a feminist. That makes it really upset you. <laughs> and I just don't necessarily <laughs> feel like I'm that political, and I'm, that seems to me to be part of the politics. Now, the invitation for the young people was to say, okay, what has happened to the word, right? That has made somebody like Dolly Parton not want to be that, right? And instead of doing that, they decided to have of a mental breakdown 
and to like kind of have all the circuits blow and to re hit reset and then basically come back to her and beg her to say that she's a feminist so they can go to sleep at night. But at no point did they take the opportunity to say, okay, wait a minute. So why would Dolly Parton, who is probably a billionaire ass at this point, based on her own talent and savvy moves, and who grew up at a time and in a place that was very, very, very sexist. I mean, that's probably there's a better word for that. Um, what would make her not want to be or not want to call herself a feminist? And that, that that is not her fault or a blind spot on her side. And they just didn't do that. They didn't do that at all. Mm. And then even when the Jolene, they came back with Jolene, and like they just were convinced that Jolene was well. well Here's a woman and she's begging another woman to like not steal her man. That doesn't sound, it's a great song and it's human and it feels real, but they don't like that. So they found somebody to write a third part to it where Jolene and the woman go off together and have a lesbian affair, <laughs> which is like, are you kidding me? It only works for you that way. And then they played it for, for Dolly. She's like, I never thought of that. And they said, you didn't think of it? We just assumed that this was part of your plan. Like, are you kidding me? No, I never thought of it. Like, but is this really important to you that this happened? Is you feel like this is not the way often the way romantic love is? And that just, I just thought it was funny. It was just funny that you, they just couldn't, you know, they were, they were zeroists, right? It was like, she has to be what we want her to be. And she has to say the words we want her to say, or we're going to, we're going to hold our breath and pound our spoon on the high chair. I mean, yes, but at the same time, I do think they were, they, I don't know if they were necessarily like, this is the way that you must have thought. I think it was more like, what if entertain this thought experiment with us, Dolly. But I think where you're, where she, when she responds, like you can interpret it that way. But that's not what I was thinking about. <laughs> like that's that's I feel like is the disconnect. I, I don't think it makes it less embarrassing for them. You don't. You don't. <laughs> <That> they, <laughs> I, I mean, their their argument. I mean, obviously, that, uh, that everybody listening this should go and listen to that podcast. Their argument right. was that when the woman is singing to Jolene, she says, "I, I get you're beautiful. Yeah. I get how beautiful you are." And their only way of processing that lyric was as a, like, "Oh, I bet she's kind of a crypto right. lesbian." Whereas in fact, the human way is like, no way. Envy. Envy and like self-esteem. And I know that I'm not, I know that I'm not as beautiful as you are and that my husband has been spending time with you. It's not even, right. I hope you, I stop seeing my husband. Just don't steal him from me. And that is like, you know, everyone who's ever been in a, romance has experienced that and like the idea that like that's a human feeling that it will you cannot process through your you know gender studies class textbooks <laughs> and the idea that like well if that's the case then let's get rid of that human feeling and just right. continue writing another piece of the gender studies textbook and to me that's very, <laughs> very sad and right. very weird because you know the brain doesn't work that way either is the heart yeah this this is like uh, what we talk about with Chloe Valdry a bit, um, yeah. Adam, because uh, Chloe Valdry has this like the theory of enchantment, mm -hmm. right? And it, I think for as we've kind of lost that muscle a little bit, like how to re relate to each other on on a basic humanity. Although, level. although here I think there's also another layer of something that has culturally become. I, I don't know if taboo, but almost just like completely fell into the blind spot, which is the power of beauty, because when. Body positivity becomes lingua franca, and everyone is just as perfect as they are, and you're, you're just beautiful the way you are. Then it becomes impossible to talk about the natural and almost tyrannical inequality of beauty. It's a real power differential that we're not dealing with in a mature and honest way, I think, these days in society. Not, not with that, not with age. We love to talk about different ways in which society creates and perpetuates inequities. But when it comes to one of the most ancient inequalities, and that's the unfair, unearned, and rapidly vanishing power of young, beautiful people over society, we just need to pretend as if it doesn't exist. Yeah. It's something that I remember having a 
conversation about with uh, Nancy Ramalan, if you know her. Oh, yeah, I know. I, know I should Rainier. absolutely get her on the podcast to talk about this more extensively. She's an amazing journalist. Yeah. But the point is that this is just something that is ineradicably true and ineradicably unfair. And it's at the heart of Jolene. But because this is not something, this, these aren't the battles that we are allowed to fight today because it doesn't neatly fall into Trump versus AOC or anti-racists versus white supremacy or allies versus the patriarchy, then we're expected to just turn a blind eye or at least contextualize it stupidly and narrowly within the permissible battles. Hence the gay reading of Jolene. Yeah, I mean, human feelings that you cannot perfect or debate away or sequester, that is the heart of everything that's been written. That's the heart of all art, right? Anything has been written and thought, and every movie, TV show, play, poem, saga, Greek tragedy, that's the one thing that we're the most interested in. Because, and we keep, and why the stories are always the same, because people are always the same. And it's the one thing we seem in our weird modern arrogance to be unable to accept. Um, because we just think that everything should have, everything should have a solution. Like, you know, I mean, uh, I went to the doctor today. I, 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 I've been suffering from vertigo for the past two weeks. And I had it like bad, like two weeks ago. Like I was, went to, I'm in the hospital. I thought I had a stroke, right? So I'm in there and getting all these tests. Turns out I'm fine. I have vertigo. Um, and I went to the doctor today and I'm like, I could feel like while she was going through all the things like, you know, and the tests and thing and you're doing the following her finger around and stuff. And then she said, it's vertigo, and it's probably because I was on prednisone, probably isn't the kind of vertigo that goes away if you give us give me a steroid and the inflammation goes down. It's probably just the kind of vertigo that sticks, sticks around for a while and then goes away. And I said, so what do I take to get rid of it? And she said, oh, yeah, 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 nothing. And I'm like, wait, so there's nothing? There's nothing. You just have to wait. And I, th I was mad. Like, I could feel myself getting angry. Like, uh, now I'm mad at my vert. I'm mad that you mean to tell me that there's a thing that in my body that isn't working properly, that doesn't have a medication, re a medical remedy. And I, re I think I was outraged, like for like a nanosecond, but I really felt it. Like, I'm like, this is outrageous. And you call yourself a hospital. Like, I mean, like, there's got to be a solution to this problem that I have that's really, that's a mystery to you. Like, I remember like, thinking to myself, like, where did you go to medical school that you don't have a solution to my, like, like, like I didn't, I, I'm expanding it in my head, right? It didn't really go that long, but it went long enough. I, I knew I was feeling this, uh, this outrage that, well, it's like, it's like the outrage that people have, like, are you telling me that just because you're an attractive person, I'm going to feel awkward and say something stupid to you? at a party and then think about it for the next week at three in the morning how dare you it's like <laughs> it's like well yeah yeah there's no solution to that and you can like you can read as many gender studies things that you can be as woke as you can be you're not gonna escape <laughs> I had a I had a thought, but I got lost in your story. <laughs> that's good. That's my job. <laughs> that's, that's your job. <laughs> um, no, so you you've seen gen, uh, if you can help me dispel maybe my own present bias, bias of the now. Um, you've seen several generations of the, the film and screen industries, and and you've seen it mutate and become recalcitrant and rebel against itself. Is their truth to my feeling that there are more taboos now in the industry than there were like maybe 20, 30 years ago. More than there were five years ago. I mean, somebody did a, a, a incredibly evil, I mean, mischievously evil test where they showed you a speech uh, and the speech was about how yeah, you know, there's still some, you know, some bad stuff in America with race, but basically we're much better off than we ever were, and the, America's still the best country, and, you know, it gets better bit by bit. And they just ask people, like, what, what do you think of that? Do you think it, that was... What, do you think that this speech was an example of, you know, 
uh, leadership or white supremacy or whatever. I and mean, it was overwhelmingly white supremacy. It was a speech by Barack Obama. And like that, he was president not that long ago. I mean, we, we, we always forget like what happened a, a minute ago. But like, remember a minute ago when he was president? He was president. People forget, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think there's like huge taboos, like which is strange to me because there aren't, I mean, we know how we sound in private. We know that we talk freely in private. I don't mean that we speak, we're, we're, we're evil in private or that we say racial, racist things in private. I mean that we just talk about subjects in private with our friends of all description that, that is much more free and honest than we are when we are, when, when, when the job is to be free and honest, which is what show business is supposed to be. I worry though, to what extent, like we, we know that television is imitating the, 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 the discomfort of people to talk about these things publicly because we know how bad the public conversation is. But I wonder to what extent people in their private lives are now mirroring the inanity of television. You said like a TV show will just show people talking about dating and will completely elide anything that is remotely meaningful. I wonder how many, much people are just absorbing that back into their lives because this is what they're seeing. It's the example of Soviet Russian media where at some point you're just aware that these are the cues that you're not allowed to think publicly and at some point you're just going to be not thinking them even at the privacy of your own home maybe i mean that didn't work in soviet russia um but i'm not i maybe i don't know i just feel like I, I, i'm not sure i'm not sure about that i i think people i don't think they're disciplined enough to be you know a 1984 style you know, communication. But, no, but that's the thing. I, do, I don't think that it's a. That's. I, I don't see it as a 1984 thing. I see it as just a, as a as a self perpetuating cycle. People in Hollywood are giving us the values that they think we are expecting them to show us, and then we are starting to live in our lives those screen models that that we think reflect the way that a good person behaves. Maybe. And it just becomes a simulacrum of a simulacrum of a simulacrum. Uh, maybe. I, I just don't see any evidence. I see more evidence that people are having these conversations. They're just not having them openly on in, 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 in the in the business that I make my money in. But they're having them right. on Twitter and YouTube and and, uh, mm. and they're having crackpot ones that I don't like, but they're still having them. Um, there are people saying things on the street. There's say, you know, people saying them you're Uber driver, or like the people are saying stuff and and it's interesting. But uh, but I'm not sure I'm not I'm not sure that I don't know. I don't know whether you can extinguish that from people. People, it's always going to be like, you know, essentially it's just essentially the Canterbury Tales, right? Like, you know, was it 1400, 1390, 1380, 800 years ago, whatever. Eh, the people, they're just like sitting around telling stories and like making jokes and <laughs> making fun of the priest and like telling horrible stories and telling dirty jokes and then like getting offended and then yelling at each other. And then they get up in the next morning, they keep walking to Canterbury. Like, I, I feel like that's not that you, I don't think you can extinguish that. I just think that is a, is a, is a business matter. The people that seem to have really mastered the ability to tell these stories and to depict these characters in a way that other people, that an audience has found fascinating and magnetic and, and, and attractive, um, those people aren't doing it, and so I don't know why they're not doing it. I don't think you can extinguish the the you know the whatever it is that makes humans human. I mean, I know maybe Elon Musk is is trying to in some way, but I don't think that that's it's going to be happening because of of woke television. But what can happen, and I think that's where art is relevant, is just the that you could drag or call out the vocabulary to such an extent that people are losing the ability to nimbly discuss what they're feeling and or do it in a way that isn't all out right. crazy. And then your options are you either talk like Tucker Carlson or like John Oliver. So right. you, you can't think in between anymore. It, until somebody does it. So like, like I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I graduated from college, I went to film school. And I was at UCLA Film School. And um, this is like the late 80s. And uh, somebody came, I forget who it was, a big producer at the time came to speak to our little tiny little 10 person screenwriting class. And because uh, at that point, like UCLA was like, you see, you see, like everybody was like, there was the business was always, they're always like agents were always coming in like, hey, what do you got? You know? Um, and he said, listen, let me tell you something. I, I don't, you know, he's an older guy. He said like, there's only, I don't know. I can't give you any career advice really, except this, is that you're a writer. So you got to like dig deep into your heart and tell a story. From your soul 
You've got to think about what matters to you and what's mattered to you in your life, what you dream about, what's true, what's true for you, your true story, your true passion. And you've got to put that in your script. And if you do that, just focus entirely on that, on being truthful to your passions and your stories that you will succeed unless you write a Western. Don't write a Western. <laughs> and he wasn't kidding. He's like, don't write a Western though, because nobody's buying Westerns. <laughs> it's kind of true at the time. But then like a year later, a giant Western came. It was like Silverado or Young Guns or something. Just huge blockbuster movie that made hundreds of millions of dollars was because somebody said, ah, screw you. I'm going to write a Western anyway. <laughs> and then like, you know, nothing works. And then suddenly it works. Every, oh, you can't say any of that on TV. And then suddenly you can. Hmm. I mean, uh, in, in late 1960s, uh, CBS was all these kind of rural single camera comedies, which now when you say it seems like single camera comedy is so sophisticated. Now, oh, they're much better than multi-camera. Right? Um, but in the 60s, they were all Beverly Hillbillies and Gilligan's Island and stuff like that. Maybe RFD, like this old Andy Griffith show. These like, uh, you know, soft, soft, like rural comedies. And CBS, like we're getting, you know, we're getting killed here because... You know, our audience is rubes. We need to get sophisticated people back. And so they decided to come up with edgy, modern fare, like All in the Family and the Mary Tyler Moore show. These are edgy, like they're funny and they're edgy. And we have an audience there. So it's like a play. And all the things you said you couldn't talk about in the 60s, now you could talk about, sort of. Like All in the Family, they would talk about venereal disease and they used the N word. Um, and Mary Tyler Moore, they. <laughs> They, uh, they, it was, she was a single gal in the city. And so they needed to like, when they designed her set, they designed it as a studio apartment, which meant that whenever you were in her apartment, you were also looking at the bed because it was a sofa. And so you knew she wasn't sleeping with a guy because hmm. otherwise that would be unacceptable. Um, and there was like this weird thing where people go, oh, I, I, it's okay. She's not, you know, she's not this sexually liberated young woman out on her own. Our beloved Mary Tyler Moore, who was, you know, five years ago, married to Dick Van Dyke and the Dick Van Dyke show. No, she's like, she's virginal. And we know she's virginal because that sofa bed is still closed up. And like, that was the message that they wanted to send. So like, I don't know. And then later, I mean, that was a taboo, but they broke it. And then. Then in that same episode, the same series was like two years later, three years later, they decided that the world had changed a little bit. So she moved and then she got her own bedroom and then they had her have sleepover dates like, oh, oh whore, you know, like, but <laughs> that's happened within the series that happens all the time. Like, and then, you know, 10 years later, then Will and Grace, not 10, but like, you know, 15 years later, Will and Grace is on it. And like, yeah, I don't know, like, I, I, I nothing, everything's forbidden and then somebody does it. Is there anything worth watching right now in your estimation? Watching, listening to something? something I am absolutely the wrong person to ask that. Because, <laughs> you know, here's the thing. It's like, I, 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 I like watching old movies. Mm -hmm. Is there anything particularly resonant then right now? You mean that's new or like old movies? It could be old if you're not watching something new. Yeah. Oh, I, I will watch anything uh, on the Criterion channel. Mostly because of some stuff that I haven't seen. There's a lot of stuff I haven't seen. And it's always like really surprising. And I'm also a sucker for like, any old New York movies or old LA movies where I'm going to see old, my old neighborhoods somehow. Like I'm kind mm -hmm. of interested in that. Um, but people love, there's a lot of stuff on TV that I'm supposed to watch that people talk about how much they love. And I think it's fine. I mean, it's good. It's, it's good. So I just feel like there's that one itch that TV's not scratching. That is, you know, this billion dollar mother load that they're not exploiting and they're leaving it to, a bunch of, um, you know, to be the nicest way to be to put it is a bunch of like screaming, shrieking amateurs, like a bunch of people screaming on Twitter or YouTube or TikTok about stuff or cable news rather than like making it funny and interesting and more truthful, ironically, by making it scripted. I could keep you here for hours longer, but abduction is a <laughs> it's still a crime. It's a messy process. Also so, harder to uh, do over Zoom, by the way, just so you know. Before asking you my final thought for today i do want to give you a chance to answer the chekhov gun question and oh tell us a bit about yourself 
Oh uh, well, you know, it's been a, I'm a you know been a uh, television writer and producer for thirty years plus, and um, had some success and had a lot of shows that were on and off very quickly, and still do it and still enjoy it. And I mean, and then I do other kinds of writing. I do a podcast called Martini Shot, which you can find and please subscribe to, uh, which I tell little stories about show business or you know little stories about my life, and then I try to bend those things and twist them into being relevant about show business, which doesn't always work. Um, <laughs> Uh, and that's kind of how I've you know, done it. Like I'm, you know, uh, uh, kind of a, you know, a journeyman writer. I write, you know, a little bit of everything. And I, a couple books, I've had a couple books, pub- more than a couple, but three books published. And I'm trying to work on a fourth one, which is about um, the past four, three, four years where I've been just like doing, hu- not huge amounts, but I've been doing serious amounts of psychedelic uh, research, we'll call it. <laughs> Uh, and um, and what I've discovered about the human brain, or not the human brain, but my brain. Hmm. That, that, that particular human brain. That particular human brain. I, I will also say it in the intro, but I can't recommend enough um, consuming every piece of content created by uh, Rob. <laughs> consuming it. If, you, if you're a, a lazy listener, then definitely subscribe to Martini Shot because it is just like five minutes of, of joy and, you know... Something that actually touches the human experience in a way that that is totally absent elsewhere. Oh, that's so very nice you say. Thank you. You should just you should do it, dear listener. So we talked a lot about truth, and many of your anecdotes touch on this theme that I have a special predilection for, and it's the 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 falseness of the industry of truth. So from my mm-hmm. perspective, I've talked a lot about how the bad incentives of the current state of news media, for instance, is leading to a dissonance between the ideals of the industry and the way that people actually conduct their day-to-day business. This industry is shrinking, jobs are vanishing, and the merchants of truth find less and less space for sincerity in the day-to-day because they need to be constantly on alert. Too much sincerity and you lose your job. And so a shrinking industry incentivizes competitive, backstabbing, and wholly dishonest behavior. And while working and living through this is depressing, to being more aloof and observing it with detachment is really interesting. Listeners have probably heard me talk about this a lot. And this is for my industry. I'd like to hear if there are any stories of this kind that you can share from yours. You know, about the dishonesty baked into the industry. I think everyone in an industry has this experience where they read an article about something that happened in their world that they know how it unfolded. And the article is completely wrong. And then you wonder, like, is that wrong for everything? I mean, is, is this an example just because I have special knowledge of how something unfolded that and I mean, I do have stories that I will, I probably won't share, but uh, that 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 provide a context that is a, a, that was in in a, a few specific instances that are now uh, were became a very celebrated or very well known because of sort of the Me Too movement, which I'm generally in favor of and I support. But there were two or three examples that I could think of in which that it didn't happen that way, um, and. Uh, but you can't say it didn't happen that way, if you know what I mean. Like you're like, well, that ship has sailed, and I'm sorry for that guy, but you know, they're going to take him down for a lot of things. And he probably deserves it, but these three things that I happen to know about, that's unfair. That's unfair. But that's in my industry. Okay, <laughs> I want to hear from yours. I just want a story about the everyday, run of the mill dishonesty of showbiz. Well, I mean, everyday dishonesty of show business is like, well, I guess I, I, I don't know about a specific story, but there is this one moment where it's actually, it's well known, right? It's like it, nobody, nobody's hiding their dishonesty um, uh, where um, it was the, uh, making a, the movie. I think the movie was Indecent Proposal years ago, Robert Redford. And there was, uh, and you know, when you make a movie, the studio head is somewhere at the studio and then the movie stars are doing a set. But every now and then, especially a movie like that, we have this big movie star. You kind of have to, at some point, you're the chairman of the studio. You got to go visit the set and they have your lunch for you. And you kind of talk to the movie star and you talk to the director and you just kind of show up and like look like you're presiding over this. 
And one day it was just like they were late and the, or the, the, the production was actually doing really, really efficiently. So it was near the end of the day when the, the studio had arrived and she arrived and the, you know, the helicopter comes down and, um, and they're shooting in Malibu and they're just doing pickup stuff, really. So they're just doing stuff where Robert Redford just picks up a glass and then puts it down and picks up a glass and puts it down and picks up a glass and puts it down just so they have it. And they're doing what they call coverage, just so in case they have to lift something that they can match it to the glass, right? Just simple stuff. Often a movie star won't even do that, but Redford's like old school. Like he's, I'm doing this stuff. Like I'm, it's my hand. Like I'm doing it. Um, but he's not really doing anything. He's just like putting, you know, and it's like it's only 20 minutes. And they kind of delayed it because they knew that she was arriving and they didn't want to wrap for the day and have her like arrive for nothing. So they kind of like made this thing happen. And she's there. She's very excited. And they do this five times. And then she runs up to him afterwards and say, cut. And she says, Bob, that was incredible. <laughs> really, she says to him, looking at him deep in the eye. Really? I'm not even lying to you. <laughs> Which is like a weird phrase. I'm not even lying to you. Like, that's weird. Like, and what she meant, I think, was you know, and I know that I lie to people all the time. And I know that you know that I lie to people all the time. But even knowing all of those things, I want you to know that even though I know that you think I'm lying, I'm not even lying to you about this. And apparently he was like, well, thank you. But of course she was lying because he didn't do anything. He just put his glass. It, was, it wasn't even like it was going to leave the scene. It was just, so she had to say, you're great. I know I'm a liar professionally, but hey, in this instance, I'm not even lying to you, even though she was basically lying to him. And, it, but I guess the the takeaway from him was I'm such an important person that this person <laughs> will lie to me six times in one sentence that's how important i am i'm i'm important enough to be lied to like that and i think that you know that i get that's called talent management it's really really and it was really effective she was really good at her job that's a, like I, I don't even mean this as a criticism this is actually how you work with talented people you shower them with praise as much as you possibly can um because they're insecure and they're weird and you want them to like you and you want them to come back and do stuff later you know is that close that was perfect Okay. I'm not even lying to you. <laughs> there you go. See, you're getting good at this. <laughs> Rob, thank you so much. Thank you. Happy to. Happy to. Yeah, this was incredibly fun. I, I hope we can do it in day, again someday. Yeah, I'll have to come and... up with different things to say, though. I'll, come with, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say the opposite. That's I'm good at that. I'm really good at that. <laughs> the Groucho Marx approach. I'll just, I'll just do the opposite. I'll say everything backwards. Thank you for listening to Uncertain Things. Follow us on uncertain.substack.com or wherever you get your podcasts. We are Uncertain Pod on the social media. If you're feeling generous, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. And share us with your friends and enemies. Till next time, stay sane. Well, there's also like a, a lack of self-awareness about it, which I think is... That I think in terms of comedy, that's kind of interesting. Like the comedy, like the there's all there's like the the news politics shows, like the John Olivers and everything. But there's also like the late night comedy shows, um, and it's funny because like I would watch those shows quite happily um, before we started to do this podcast, and then like after it's like it becomes more difficult when you realize that like it's just talking to such a specific segment of people um, and leaving others out of the conversation. And I don't think there's any awareness really, or if there is awareness, it's like, well, but I'm right. So, so why would I adjust my tone um, or try to be more inclusive of more people in this country? I mean, it's kind of astonishing when you think about the fact that like late night comedy show, it really was supposed to be for every kind of American and it's just not anymore. Um, the, on the other side with the John Oliver and everything, I mean, there is like a, a some sort of, um, almost like a, a journalistic integrity, quote unquote, in terms of like the research that they do and the investig uh, investigations that they do, which then also makes them differently problematic because it's like, they're taking the tools of journalism and putting more attention to certain issues that actually I think should be, uh, more paid more attention to often, but then putting it in such a slant um, that it then ceases, it, it kind of, it, it doesn't, it's not like it's pretending to be journalism, but it, it is kind of pretending to be journalism. And therefore the slant becomes even more problematic potentially in a way that we might say is more problematic than the late night comedy. I don't know. In a way that is unfortunate too, because, because what you're pointing out is just, it's especially unfortunate 
with John Oliver because of their clearly they clearly have a serious research journal journalistic team yeah doing the research and yeah. and they do deal with stories that that often do slip mainstream media's attention and that's that although less and less so i find like more and more their content is just along the lines of what everybody's talking about already but sometimes they still do those investigatives about something that is that is may maybe have gone on under your radar which is great mm. But but then, as you said, then that slant becomes more offensive with John Stewart and a lot of conservatives used to hate him for hiding behind the I'm just a comedian. I'm just an entertainer uh, yeah. moniker and, and and then slipping in his commentary. But I, I thought the conservative responses to that were uh, ridiculous because he actually did focus on the comedy and he, the comedy derived from the absurdity of the, the situation or of the media clips that he was commenting on. So the commentary, the commentary and the comedy were intertwined. Whereas with John Oliver, I really don't see him as a comedian. It's, and it's not just my, my personal distaste for his humor. It's the, the fact that his comedy seems to be tacked on top of whatever political commentary has to say. So for him, it really is, which is totally fine in theory. Like, I, I, don't, I don't need to like it comedically, but I can still appreciate the idea of you're dealing with a subject, you're trying to tell it, and then you're just peppering it with some jokes to, and quips and, you know, celebrity comparisons to make it more digestible. Totally legitimate concept, but at that point you are, strictly speaking, in the news realm and not really, in my view, in the comedy entertainment satire world i don't see him as a satirist at all he's not satirizing anything he is just telling you a story and selling you his perspective on that story mm -hmm. with with an additional like some you know fuzzy emojis like the the comedic equivalent of an emoji mm -hmm. um i mean i'm, I'm curious what rob i mean because rob is going to be able to comment not just on this, but on fiction. And I, I am curious to think about how this has bled into the world of fiction, because I feel like that's something that I haven't quite opened my eyes to. You know, I know that people have said that like certain, like the kinds of, I don't know, like families that get featured in sitcom could in its, in and of itself be something that feels like is I'm speaking to one audience and not another audience. Mm. But I don't know. I, I personally haven't felt put off by the fictional content that I've consumed um, at least yet. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm in a way I'm almost fuzzy on like, what would that even look like? Like, what does it, what does it mean when fiction has like betrayed its <laughs> roots? And admittedly for me, the fictions that I've consumed have either offended me or not offended me based on the quality of the writing, less about <laughs> the degree right. of wokeness. I, I right. usually, and it can be a woke story if it's done well, exactly. like that's the thing you it, can forgive a lot. <laughs> exactly. No. And I, and, and I'm not, I don't, I don't necessarily object woke stuff for, to, by the way, I can enjoy a lot of things that are done. Well, I can enjoy Nazi propaganda if it's done well. So <laughs> uh, like that, that's why I think there's a lot, a, a lot of the reviews of old films that had some, some, problematic elements to them are are embarrassing to me because I, I i like them for the craft and you can just acknowledge that a lot of them the messaging of the time was awful yeah yeah and so i can i can do that with with racist movies from the or movies with racist shades from the 30s and 40s i can do it with m misogenic misogynistic 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 content from the 50s and 60s and i can definitely do it with woe content today as long as it is done well disney stuff or superhero stuff or when the infinite deluge of uh, more ex universe expanding bullshit that's that's what offends me that that that, that mm. like irritates me to no end like every time yeah. i hear about another ip that is being like drained out of of, of right, substance right. like I, i'm like enough you know, let it go let things yeah. go what was the latest thing that was a, 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 a children's show that i think was um like from the 90s that was turned into a arthur movie? Uh, oh no oh, arthur it, they let it go they let go of arthur oh they were planning an arthur revival a reboot <laughs> They weren't. They're just they're letting it die, which is sad for me. I liked Arthur. Uh, I like many things, but some things need to die. <laughs> Fair enough. 